we have the uh, author of a book called Blinded by Corona, Professor John Ashton, CBE, joining us. Hopefully. Is he there? Hello. Hello there. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you, but the dogs are barking. But they... oh. <laughs> oh, I see. Um, first of all, um, Mike, you've got a question you, about America before we start about yeah, the UK. because we want to primarily discuss the UK, but um, I wondered what your personal opinion was on, um, on Texas reopening with no social distancing whatsoever on the 10th of March. Well, how long have you got? I mean, <laughs> you know, America is such a tantalising place, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you know, who can disagree with the founding fathers, we the people? Um, and they escaped from the tyranny of the monarchy here in England. And then they created this sort of anarchistic country where, in theory, you can start off in a log cabin and you can finish up as president, but actually you've got to be a multi-millionaire. And mm. they've got all these people who've been abandoned in the Midwest, um, you know, grubbing a living in many places. There's some very poor people in Texas. It's not all oil. And it's a bit like the red line um, in the north of England that the Conservatives tapped into last year, you know, Yes. Um, in, in the general election. So it's very complicated, all this stuff. I mean, you've got all this religious fundamentalism thrown into the mix. And there's not one America. You know, there's, I've got a book on the shelves here called The Nine Nations of North America. You know, yeah. got Ecotopia on the West Coast and you've got the industrial. You've got, it's a complicated business, America. And yeah. uh, personally speaking, I, I, you know, move between despair and feeling that if I was a young man in the time when they were opening up the West, I might have been there. You know, it's mm. a very complicated business. It is. Um, I think that, that above all things that shocked me when this uh, happened, because I'm used to... Uh, people when there is a genuine crisis everybody just pulling together and getting on with stuff and I, I just can't understand the politicisation over there of it it happened here, it's still happening here we've got in Manchester people doing freedom marches uh, which uh, we cover on the show and and it, I, these anti-vaxxers that do all this drive me insane And but in America to me they turned wearing a mask into being a member of the Democratic Party or anti-Trump which I find shocking I know but you know anti-vaccination anti-science anti-the enlightenment has a very long history you know I mean mm. you know we had the Inquisition in Spain you know we had the Christians putting people to death um, we have these millennium movements that crop up from time to time. You had, you had um, Jones in Guyana, you know, killed all those people. Yeah. When was that? 35 years ago now. Oh, yeah, um, no. People believing in, people believe it's the end of days, the Old Testament stuff about the apocalypse. And yes, of course, we've got the apocalypse on the agenda because of the way we're ruining the planet. But ironically, the same people who um, believe in the end of days probably don't believe in global warming. You know, it's Absolutely. so strange. Absolutely. I am, I'm relieved Biden's in on that <coughs> score, but um, I agree with you. The apocalypse, if, if things don't change soon, very quickly, it might even be too late now. But moving on, uh, I remember watching you last year on, I think it's Question Time, and you sort of said, this will happen, this will happen if we don't do this on that. And it happened. But nobody sort of took on board and nobody seemed to believe you. Um, how do you feel about that now you, you, you was right? <laughs> well, it's a very strange thing, you know. It doesn't give me any pleasure. Um, I've been in public health for over 40 years and I've been involved with all sorts of disasters and emergencies. I was, in my, you know, my first 
the blooding was Hillsborough. Yeah. Um, but then later on, professionally, I had to deal with um, the aftermath of three IRA incidents in the Northwest. Um, the Legionella with the the uh, outbreak in Barrow, the the cocklers getting drowned, the Chinese in yeah. Morecambe Bay, the mass shootings. Um, in Cumbria, we had the floods, and I, I think I'm I'm sort of hardwired now to know when something's going badly wrong. Um, and I I'd been asked out to um, Bahrain last February to advise the uh, Crown Prince of Task Force on um, COVID, and to to actually take it apart, take the plans apart and tell them what they got wrong and what they should do, which is an amazing uh, thing to be able to do. And they've done really, really well. I mean, they're right at the top of the World League table on how well they've done with COVID. But the day I um, was on question time, I'd just come off the plane back from Bahrain. And it was that week um, in March when everything happened, when the Cheltenham Festival happened, uh, the Liverpool Atletico Madrid game was going ahead that night or the, the previous night and um, the um, chief scientist was telling everybody that herd immunity would be a good idea and I'd been in Bahrain where the crown prince who um, is a Cambridge history graduate and a very sophisticated man who's got a very good understanding of these things he and I got on well he realized the importance of getting to grips with this and he'd set up um, a war room for covid on the 3rd of february last year when boris johnson was mm -hmm. off with his mistress and fannying around yeah sorting true. out his marital yeah, affairs true. and true. i came into to the program um two contrasting things in my head and then we had stephen barclay minister in the treasury who just was so stupid about all of this. And we had a wonderful audience in West Bromwich um, who were not fools at all, you know, and they weren't taken in by the fact that Fiona Bruce gave him the lion's share. I mean, I was accused later on of dominating the programme, but I, I've listened to it several times and I measured how much time Barclay had <laughs> and how much time I had. He had 21 minutes. I had 14 minutes, right. um, and he's been on question time twice since then. Well, I think uh, that show's been a back. shambles since she you took know. over. Uh, it used to be a balanced show. It, it, uh, I know sometimes the BBC gets accused of government bias, but I've always found it under certain presenters to be reasonable and the discourse to be balanced on occasion. It's been, uh, but it, it seems like propaganda to me watching that show now. Well, it, it, it shows how badly the BBC has fallen. They've been intimidated by the government and now they've got their own place people running the show. Um, I mean, I, I look for, for Sky and for Channel 4 and for the new digital channels like this for my information now. When, uh, when we made certain amount of progress, but obviously there was going to be a second wave, a second curve of this, why why was science ignored heading into Christmas after making progress? Why why was it that Boris and the government seemed so determined to ignore everybody and have five days or four days relaxed over Christmas to let the thing just go out of control, which then he had to backpedal and reduce it to one day and come off looking rather stupid? I think, you know... It it takes longer than we've got to really go into that. But, you know, setting aside the fact that public health's been run down for 10 years, uh, that it's been asset stripped in local governments, um, that local directors of public health have been marginalized until this pandemic, setting aside all of that, it does come back to the failure of leadership of Boris Johnson and his his distraction by Brexit and his mistress and all the rest of it. Yeah. But it, it, I think the real issue is he's weak and he's been torn um, over the last 12 months between the needs of public health 
and the pressure from born-again free marketeers mm. who just wanted to let the economy rip again and weren't concerned about the tens of thousands of people's loved ones who've now died unnecessarily. And so his indecisiveness and his vacillation led to all these inconsistent policies. And we saw that particularly over the last few months and with the lead up to Christmas when, you know, he'd been advised by Sage um, to have a, a fire break for the autumn half term and he ignored that. And then he got all gung-ho on having a normal five days for Christmas. And it was obvious to those of us who were looking at the increasing numbers that that was, you know, was not the right thing to do. Mm. And we've now got the same business of a narrative which is encouraging everybody to think that can go and have summer holidays in Europe. And, you know, that may not be the case. It may be that we will be all right in the UK because the one thing that they've got right, they, you know, I, I've said before, Boris Johnson has not put a foot right in this pandemic, but the, the one thing they've done right is to get the vaccines in place. And the interesting thing about that is that most of that's been down to local national health service. It's not been to private companies mm. who've run away with billions of pounds. <laughs> well, but, we covered you know, that. He, he's yeah. now been building up expectations of normal summer holidays, but the, they've got big problems in Spain and Italy and the countries that people normally would expect to go to on their summer holidays from yeah. here. And, People should not be planning summer holidays outside the UK. Um, they yeah. should be thinking of doing something local. We've been talking about we've, this is exactly what we've been saying on the show. I mean, I was mortified when an advert came on that we've all seen for Ryanair that ended up being pulled because it was deemed to be misleading by advertising standards that came up with the slogan, jab and go. Jab and go. Yeah, jab and go. And, and really, you know, just because you've had one vaccine doesn't mean you won't get it. If you Even with two, you won't get it necessarily. You, you might still get it. And the mutations are there. And we don't know what this means. This virus is a clever little fella. It's, it's the simplest life form, a bit of RNA. And because it's so simple, it keeps changing. And yeah. it can come back with a vengeance. And we just need to chill out and, you know, make the most of our own environment for the next few months. John, before we talk about your book, um, I mentioned that you were coming on the show and we've been on a date, really, in the date with the emails. Uh, can I read a couple of them out to you? Just a few questions, really, for you. Um, one of them, this is from Elaine, it says, uh, we're constantly told that schools are safe. So when they reopen, will infection rates rise again, like they did in September? Well, I hope they won't, but you know, the problem we've got again, and it shows the narrow um, advisory mechanisms that the government's got, because you know, de the deaths have been horrendous, um, but it looks as though the deaths are now coming down. The latest figure for today is 234, I think. Um, it's coming down uh, each day steadily, and. Um, you know, there are other things to consider. We've got to consider long COVID, um, which seems to affect about 10% of people who've had it and may persist with them for the rest of their lives with various illnesses and chronic conditions. We've got to consider the mental health aspect of this, which is going to turn out to be a parallel epidemic of um, anxiety, uh, phobias about going out, um, depression, all sorts of things on the mental health side. But, you know, the, the thing I'm concerned about is that because the focus still is on reducing deaths, when deaths are actually going to be very low in the immediate future, is that the spreading of it now becomes the most important thing. So why aren't we vaccinating teachers, policemen, yeah. Yeah. taxi drivers yeah. Yeah. and those young people on the checkout at Lidl yeah. and Aldi, you know, because they're the ones who are spreading it. And, you know, that's where a lot of people are getting their viruses from. And it, the more the virus circulates, the more it can mutate. And so even though we vaccinated 
lots of people, then if we get a mutation that's resistant to the vaccine, then it'll come back and hit them as well. So we should actually be currently, and this is, I disagree you know, very strongly with what the government policy is at the moment, what the advisors have been telling them, we should have a parallel track now for vaccinating frontline workers. Now that we've, we've done pretty well everybody over 60 or 65, we now need to switch and say, right, we're going to use half the vaccine now for frontline workers and half to work down through the priority groups. Yeah, Nick has um, emailed and he asks, was it worth spending $22 billion on a trace system that fails to find someone returning from overseas with a deadly variant of COVID-19? Well, no is the answer to that, isn't it? And, you know, they've run down the local public health system. If they'd put $22 billion into local public health, we would have had a world-beating system. But they've taken... Um, mo well, I was director of public health in the Northwest for 13 years, and I was director of public health in Cumbria for six. I left Cumbria in good shape with a strong team. Cumbria has not done badly, actually, during this, but the number of uh, staff there is a fraction of what it was in 2013. The local authority got rid of people, and the government had cut the budget dr dramatically for public health, and that's happened all over the country. They, they didn't have the capacity to do the testing and tracing, which has always been bread and butter for public health at the local level. What we in the game call shoe leather epidemiology, going around street to street, door to door, finding out where the problem is and stopping it in its tracks. We've got another email asking uh, what will happen after this lockdown ends. This person's worried, saying, I've no idea when, when, when we're supposed to go back into the office or whether it will be safe to do so. Well, again, you know, there's a lot of unknowns. I mean, one of the problems about this whole thing has been the government and its advisors have never been willing to put their hands up when they didn't know something. They've always pretended they knew things that they didn't. And that's, that's contributed to the breakdown of trust because the public will trust you. I've discovered that in 40 years in public health. If the public will trust you, if you say, I don't know, but my best bet is this, that or the other. But they never, they never admit to not knowing. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I think we've got to be cautious. Uh, we, you know, we, we really don't know what's going to happen as we ease off. But the problem, as I just indicated earlier, is that if we tell people that you can be business as usual come June, July, I'm afraid that's a hostage to fortune. Life has changed. I mean, it, for argument's sake, it may be that there are going to be in future a third less office days worked. You know, a, the proportion, lots of people are now going to be wanting to work two or three days a week in the office, partly from home. The companies are going to want to embrace this. I mean, we've been very slow in this country at embracing dis, uh, remote working. It's much more common mm. before the pandemic in North America, but British bosses and companies don't trust their workers, although it's been no. shown. It's been shown that, um, you know, Productivity is better when people aren't spending an hour or more going to work and coming home again in the evening. And they actually put in more hours if they're at home than if they're going in somewhere. You know, Do you think some so there's so many things are going to be changed as a result of this. Life will, yeah. will not be the same. I mean, I, I'm very interested in the history of public health. And we know from pandemics of the past that there have been dramatic changes following pandemics. If you look at what happened in the plague years in the 1300s, it led to the summer of blood in, uh, in June, July, with 500 people in London having their heads chopped off because of what really? had happened to the peasants as a result of the plague uh, and the way in which the middle class exploited the working class after the plague. And you get dramatic social and economic and political changes after one of these events. You mentioned that in your book, and the reason why I know that is um, I went on Amazon and I bought it, and I've read the first couple of pages as you can hadn't do, and I was reading it about the plague and the bloodless, and I was I have to buy this book. So we're here to talk about the book as well. So why did you write it for one? Well, I, I, for a number of reasons, really. 
I, I started writing at the beginning of the pandemic. I started writing a few things, um, you know, for the British Medical Journal and so on. And then I got asked to do regular things for the new uh, digital um, newspaper, uh, Byline Times. And um, I got approached by uh, Martin Ringer, who's a publisher with uh, Gibson Square Press. And he said, can you do me a quick book on this? And, you know, here I was at home. Uh, I'd been to Bahrain twice in February and March, but I was working from home, writing a lot, doing a lot of media. And I just started writing every morning. And um, you know, Martin Ringer said to me, can you write me a book on this in, um, you know, three or four months, in 12, 16 weeks? And I just started writing every morning. And I think I, I'd been encouraging people on social media to keep their own diaries of the pandemic because I think it's been so important to get the evidence for the future for if there's ever a proper judicial review and inquiry that people have charted it and you know this book of mine is the first six months up to July the 4th which the Prime Minister uh, insisted on calling Independence Day uh, after mm. American independence but uh, I think what it does is provide a reference a lot of the stuff that was happening so quickly and so fast uh, that when you cast your mind back you think oh god what happened then and what happened then and what happened then well i think i've captured most of it in one place and hopefully it'll be a reference when we come to have legal inquiries into what's happened because i've put it all down in one in one place you, we talk about the government and Boris's job on it, uh, and uh, some people think he's doing a great job. I mean, across the media, not me. Uh, and they say because he's done so well on this, and I'm me and my were, were just aghast really at, at how it's gone. I'm shocked at how inept he is. I, I didn't like him. The cards on the table. I didn't like him. I always thought it was a bit of a buffoon, but I thought there was a lot of an act with the buffoonery. I thought he might have been cleverer than uh, than that. He's been he's been awful. Well, he's awful. a narcissist, yeah, and he's not very clever. I mean, it's interesting, you know. He went to um, Oxbridge. He went to Oxford or Cambridge. I forget which one because they both blend. Yeah, he was in the but Bullingdon because, Club with be, Cameron, wasn't he? It's, it's because he'd done uh, classics at school, which nobody else does. Um, he was able to walk in with very poor A levels, mm. you know. I mean, the man's not a, not a genius. He, he, he banters around a few Greek phrases. Uh, he's been totally narcissistic throughout his life. He's un, untrustworthy. I mean, he was sacked he for, as, as a journalist for, for, for making things up. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's quite, quite remarkable that the state of British politics has come. I was just watching Kenneth Clark on the news tonight. And, um, you know, I've never been a Conservative supporter, but you know, you look at Heseltine, you look at Kenneth Clark, you look yeah. at some of the other Conservatives that we had in the 60s, 70s, 80s, who were statesmen, who were, who were clever yeah. people, and, and who had a different political philosophy to my own, but who you felt knew what they were doing. Yeah, they, they had a, you could have a political difference, but you could respect the fact that whilst the political differences of opinion were there, they were still competent at doing the job. Yeah, well, this man's lazy. Yeah. He's asleep at the wheel, and I, and I agree, and, mm. and I think Christmas showed everybody that, and I'm surprised he's, they're still ahead in the polls with what's gone on. Uh, well, it's last... because the, the problem we've got in this country is that the radical alternative is split between Labour, the Greens, the Liberals, you know, and so on. This is the problem. The Conservative Party is laughing because the radical left of centre can't get its act together. Mm. So that means that the Conservatives are always in power because of the egocentricity of the left. Absolutely. Crazy, crazy times. Um, John, thank you so much for coming on the show. We'd love to have you back at some stage. Uh, and um, again, it, you've been a wonderful guest. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice to hear the truth yeah. about this. It, it, honesty is better, even though some of it's more long-term than we want to hear. 
it's better to know and um, I'm very grateful for you coming on and telling people well it's great to be on the Mank programme thank you <laughs> you take care and buy the book that's the thing buy the book Blinded by Blinded Corona Blinded by Corona by John Ashton it's in Amazon and I know because I bought it so go out and buy it John again thank, thank you. you so much thank you bye bye what a nice guy what an informative guy yeah. and you may as, as i was saying there you may not want to hear everything that he's just said because the, the one thing that really struck me and got me right in here was when he said i throughout history whenever there's been something like this it's had prolonged ongoing consequences things haven't snapped back there has no. been permanent change after it and it it can be scary thank you for watching I'm impressed. You've passed the IQ test and got this far, so let's press that button to do the last thing that helps us. It's got subscribe on it, you can't miss it, and please ring the bell for notifications of future videos.